Well, it's good to be together uh, this morning. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're part of the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, not America. We're stepping back in time. And this empire that you're a part of, that you're living in, uh, has huge sums of wealth. The world comes to your doorstep. All the business people of the world plan their work around your economy. You're it. All the roads of the world lead to your place. All the smaller nations around you, they pay your nation tribute. And so you live in a really vibrant and beautiful economy, all kinds of wealth going in and out of your empire. When you go home at night and you step into your house, you spend the night, you wake up in the morning and you go to the market and you visit one of these flourishing markets where the wealth of the world is, is, is coming and the goods of the world are shipped to your country. And when you go to the market, though, you go to the market and there's often a statue in front of the market. And it's the statue of, an em of the emperor of your country. And the thing that all good people do in your country is stop at the statue of the emperor. And it's sitting on a stand like this. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the statue of uh, often just his head. But you're to offer an offering of thanks to this emperor. And so you offer your tribute and you put it in a little bowl and it's often burned as an offering. And then you take the ashes and you mark your wrist or you mark your forehead to show that you're a patriotic figure in your country. And then you go into the market and everybody is wearing their marks on their forehead and on their wrist as a show of solidarity and you're moving through the market with your friends and your neighbors as you shop or sell goods. And there's a certain pride that you carry when you do that. Your people are powerful. They have the most powerful military in all the world. In fact, their strategies are renowned. They've conquered all kinds of territory. Your empire shapes the world. But imagine now that you're living in that empire and sometime in the last decade you and your family and a few other neighbors you've heard about this Jesus of Galilee south of you is kind of a, a backwater territory in your in your uh, empire and your family though heard about Jesus and believed and this Jesus began to to reshape your life, your life in this church that you, you joined, that began to reshape the way you were thinking about life because you now believe that Jesus is the king, is the highest authority in your land, in your, in your family, and in your world. And now as you're being taught and you're being discipled by the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul and others, there are certain aspects of your great and honorable nation and its culture that are beginning to get just a little uncomfortable for you. It's hard to miss the fact that huge sections of your population in your country are slaves or servants. People that Jesus says in his family are now equals. And so, much to the scorn of some of your neighbors, they're looking at you sideways. Both the rich and the poor are sharing equal status in this new church fellowship that you're a part of. You begin to notice other aspects of your empire that seem less healthy than you previously thought. The obscenity, the sexual perversion that just flows unchecked through your culture seems kind of at odds with the way of Jesus and the people that you're surrounded with. It's not uncommon for your neighbors to participate in both heterosexual and homosexual relationships. You realize with new eyes that the city squares that were once a real source of pride for you because of their ornate artwork are actually filled, that artwork is actually pornographic artwork. 
And even the pottery that you bought down at the market that's all over your house that you use on a regular basis, you're looking at that and it's just, there are pornographic images all over your pottery. And your emperor, the guy in charge, the one that you bow to at the market, Nero, you used to worship him, but this guy had his own mother killed and is said to have kicked his second wife to death in a fit of rage and then went on to marry a man. But it's not just, you know, so those things are making you feel a little uncomfortable and it's, but it's not just a feeling of separation from the life you used to live. You're also beginning to sense distrust from your fellow countrymen. There are rumors in your community that your faith is cannibalistic since you eat the body of Christ at your worship gatherings and you drink his blood. There's also the feeling that you're undermining the great empire because you're just not as patriotic as you used to be. You refuse now to offer prayers at the marketplace to the emperor. And you tell people that Jesus is now your king. And you've actually been told now you're a traitor. You're someone who actually hates the empire, which you don't feel, but that's how people view you. People in your group of churches stop signing up to join the Roman legions and do their duty to advance and protect the empire. And this really angered some of your neighbors who questioned then your loyalty to them and the nation that you shared. And then the crackdown started. That was just the beginning. This new allegiance of your family was deemed a threat to the stability of the Roman Empire. The emperor was inept, Nero was inept, and he made a number of really bad policy decisions, and he had to cover his tail, and so he began to scapegoat the Christians. Angry with your lack of allegiance to his empire, he made examples out of some of the people in your churches. There was prison time for some, but that was the easy stuff. At times, he got so angry with Christians, your neighbors and friends, that he made animal skins, or he had animal skins sewn around your friends and your church members, and then he turned them loose in the arena to get torn apart by wild animals. If he was in a particularly bad mood, he even lit Jesus' people on fire and used them in his garden as torches to light up the night. These cruelties were actually documented by non-Christian Roman historians. Your church was perceived to be a threat to the Roman culture and it needed to be done away with in the minds of many. Now imagine, church, that you're living in that time period and you're living in that church. You're the body of Christ. You're suffering and you're wondering, Lord, how do we live? How do we respond to a culture and a government that sees us as the threat? And then you get a letter from your brother Peter. And when the letter comes, there's excitement because you're hurting. The crazy thing is your church is growing. There are lots of poor people that have come into the family of God and a few wealthy people, but it's painful. And some believers are still wrestling with the sexual perversion that shaped their lives and that felt so normal for so long. And many of your fellow believers are slaves or servants to masters who are not kind to them, who beat them. And they're wondering now, well, look, if I join the family of God, can I fight back now? Like, can I, can I stick it to the guy that beats me regularly and mistreats me? And then there are other members of your church group that need food and they need a way to earn a living. And they're struggling with the idea that maybe it's not entirely wrong when I go to the market, like, can I give just a little nod to Caesar and just wipe a little bit of dust on my forehead so that I can just get through the market and get my business done and earn a bit of a living for my family because we're hurting financially. Like, is God, is that, can I do that? 
But everyone's suffering and feeling like aliens in this culture to one degree or another. And there's confusion and pain and the church is searching. And then this letter comes from Peter. And with it, a sense of excitement. There's relief because Peter's going to know what to say. He's going he's to know how to help us. And he's going to have some instruction. He'll tell us how to respond. And so you gather together in the house of the person you often gather with. And as everybody gathers into the living room of this house, the letter is brought out. And everybody stands up as this letter is opened up. And it's quiet. And as everybody has stood up, the letter's opened one of the brothers reads the letter to the whole group. Would you stand as we read what Peter wrote? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as straight strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day that he visits. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and to praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. Honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God and honor the emperor. Household slaves... Submit to your masters with all reverence, not only the, to the good and the gentle, but also to the cruel ones. For it brings favor with God if, because of a consciousness of God, someone endures grief from suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and you suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. For you were called to this because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He didn't commit sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Jesus, I pray that just as you spoke into the life of the early church in Rome who was suffering so painfully, would you speak into our lives in this day and age as we move forward into a time when there very well will be more suffering for your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This is the word of the Lord for us. And after it's read, everyone sat down just as you have. 
And by the way, when that letter was read out loud, almost nobody there, it was, it was the first letter, so nobody there had copies of it. They were listening to what was being read. If you would like to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, this letter was written to a group of people who feel estranged from their culture. They feel misunderstood, they feel misrepresented, they feel marginalized, they feel criticized, and they're being punished for being followers of Jesus. One of the hard questions that I wrestle with, and I've been wrestling with for quite some time, is how my life fits with the life of faithfulness described in the scriptures, particularly as it relates to suffering. I haven't suffered significant exclusion or mockery because I follow Jesus. My life has been pretty tame. But the Bible clearly tells us that it's normal for God's people to be viewed as a threat to the culture they live in. And almost, well, actually, I think it's safe to say nearly every New Testament book written to the church, talks about suffering. It's all over the scriptures. And the reason, though, that most countries and empires and cultures view Christians as a threat is because we are. The gospel of Jesus is a threat to the power of darkness. And there is one kingdom that can have our allegiance. And when it's not the earthly one that we live in, those citizens that are around us get a little uncomfortable. Now I stated that it hasn't cost me much social capital to follow Jesus, but the reality of increased social stigmatization and exclusion for Jesus followers is becoming more real. Over the last number of decades, there have been massive cultural shifts in the United States toward a more militant secularism and away from the ethics and values born out of a Judeo-Christian worldview. That fact is really undeniable, but it's worth acknowledging, yes, yes, That's a real thing. It's happening. It's been happening. Pastor and author Tim Keller made the comment in a a recent talk that modern secular culture is now at the point where people believe that they need to be saved from the idea that they need salvation from God. In other words, in the eyes of many, the gospel that you and I believe... The gospel that says we are broken sinners without hope apart from Jesus. That gospel, the gospel of a new kingdom that Jesus is inviting us into, that he's the king with all the allegiance of his people. That gospel is rejected by modern secular culture because they believe it's dangerous To believe in the idea that we need salvation. And so actually it's a moral benefit to society to minimize and marginalize people of faith because we're a real threat. In their minds that kind of thinking is damaging to people. In response, many Christians have become frightened and enraged. Many Christians have raised defiant fists as culture warriors. And they are debasing our witness to the world. As we do anything and everything necessary to acquire political power to keep mortal enemies at bay. In fact, fact, there are Christians right now who think it's their God-given duty to join militias, or spend thousands, perhaps millions of dollars getting the right people elected. I've observed over the last year and a half numerous talks among Christians about a pending civil war, stockpiling 
all kinds of necessary equipment to carry such a war out. But we have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, is this how the kingdom of Jesus operates? Is this how Christ's body is called to be in a world that is hostile to it? To answer those questions, we do what God's people have always done down through the centuries. We turn to the scriptures. What does 1 Peter chapter 2 tell God's people? Well, it says a lot, but I want to highlight several key thoughts this morning. Number one, this passage reminds us of our identity. Look at verses 9 through 10. Peter comes into a hurting church that's being marginalized and he says, Hey, brothers and sisters, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light once you were not a people. You thought you were a people of the most powerful nation on earth, the Roman Empire. You thought you were a people. No, you weren't. But now you're God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. That's our identity. We don't fit into this culture. We don't fit here, church. We never have and we never will. We are God's people who happen to live in America through the providence of God. You didn't choose to be born here. <laughs> you didn't choose it. For some reason, God had you born in this place for this time and this season. Not because you're awesome and you're rich or anything else. Not because you're good at inventing stuff. But because God in his sovereignty puts you here. I happen to like capitalism. I happen to like democracy and a good judicial system. But if you need those things to follow Jesus, then you don't understand the gospel. We have brothers and sisters in China, in Iran, in Sudan, all over the world where those things that we enjoy are not present and you know what? The church is often far healthier in China and Iran and Sudan where those things are not present than it, the church is here in America. Jesus is it. He's our identity. He's the thing and the person and the place and the kingdom that we've been called to. How else does Peter instruct us this morning? Verse 12. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works and will glorify God on the day that he visits. Well, what does that word mean, honorably? Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. In other words, people that are not believers. How do we conduct ourselves honorably in this culture that's increasingly marginalizing us? Well, skip across the page to chapter 3. Let's read verses 14 through 16. Peter addresses this specifically, 14 through 16. By the way, the whole of 1 Peter is about suffering and how to deal with suffering. 14, verse 14 of chapter 3. But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Well, let that sink in. <laughs> You're blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now verse 16. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you're accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. In other words, what does it mean to respond honorably? We respond to our critics with gentleness and respect. That's what the Bible commands us to do. That's the instruction. Brothers and sisters, this is a hard word. But part of the suffering that I believe is to come on us as believers 
is not due to our righteousness, but is due to the fact that we've been angry and rude and belligerent and we've celebrated as heroes those who are angry and rude and bullies. They're on our podcasts. They're on our cable news shows. There's some of the politicians that we vote for and even some of the religious leaders that we look up to. And I believe that we're set to reap a whirlwind of suffering because we have not followed God's specific instruction to give a respectful and gentle answer for the faith that we possess. We have allowed unrighteous people who do not bear the fruit of God's Spirit to speak for the church. And this disease has filtered into the church and people are not full of God's Holy Spirit. The fruit of which are talked about in Galatians chapter 5 and 6. Gentleness and respect. And rather we're full of bravado and chest thumping and fear. And if this doesn't change, our punishment will be severe. What does Peter say next? Verse 13 and 17. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or the governors as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. Submit as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as God's slaves. And here it is, verse 17, honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. I don't understand that, Peter. What? Emperor Nero? Honor him? This is the guy who had his own mother killed, kicked his second wife to death, and then married a man. Peter, you're saying we honor that man? He's not worthy of our honor. This is the man who's lighting fellow believers on fire in his garden. This is the man who's ruining livelihoods, killing the economy amongst the believers, persecuting the church, and Peter says honor him. Why? Verse 20, for what credit is it then if when you do wrong and are beaten you endure it, but when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. Favor with God, what do you mean that suffering as a follower of Jesus brings favor with God? Well, chapter 4 of First Peter, verse 14, puts it another way. Peter says, the spirit of the living God of the universe is upon you when you're ridiculed for his name. In other words, something supernatural happens when God's people suffer for the sake of Christ. I want to ask you this, church. Is it any coincidence right now that in communist North Korea, where it's illegal to follow Jesus, the church has exploded in number? In fact, last December, Christianity Today, the magazine, reported that there was an estimated 300,000 Christians in the country of North Korea. These are people who are being imprisoned in work camps. There are accounts of extreme torture and execution. And the gospel is advancing rapidly in the country of North Korea. Is it any surprise right now that in communist China, where pastors have been imprisoned and church buildings have been bulldozed, there are an estimated 100 million followers of Jesus. And they're growing so fast, it's predicted that if they continue at even a modest pace of growth, there will be around 200 million believers in the next 10 years. And do you know where the church has grown the fastest over the last decade? Some of you do. The country of Iran. 
Imagine a Muslim nation where leaders are hostile to the gospel, persecuting people who follow Jesus, and the kingdom of God is advancing faster than anywhere in all the world. Some estimates put that growth at about 20% every year. In fact, I just finished a book by Francis Chan where he's talking about an Iranian Christian believer who talks about the kinds of oaths that Christians have to take when they join the church. An oath to endure suffering because they know it's going to happen. You see, the glory and the favor of God rests on God's people when they suffer. And the glory and favor of God is resting on the church in Iran and in China and in North Korea and in various places around the world where they're getting robbed, where their homes are destroyed, where their family members are killed. The glory and the favor of God rests on those who suffer for the name of Jesus. Notice the next verse in 21. Now here's the terrifying portion of this passage. Verse 21, for you were called to this, Peter says. What? You were called to this? Are you kidding me? Did you sign up for that? For you were called to this, why? Well, because Christ also suffered for you. What? Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We're called to imitate Jesus, to suffer with the kind of dignity and honor and love for our neighbors who are increasingly going to despise us. They will not understand our beliefs about the way God has created us to function. They won't. They won't understand God's design for marriage and God's design for human sexuality and our care about life of all ages. Our belief that salvation from human brokenness is only found in Jesus to the watching world that looks narrow and extreme. They will not likely accept many of our ethics. And I'm here to tell you, the Bible says that's normal. That's to be expected. Why? Church, they're pagans. <laughs> they're not in Christ. They've not been given the mind of Christ. They've not been given the gift of His Holy Spirit in their lives. They're not saved. Their allegiance isn't with Jesus, it's elsewhere. And so it does us no good to get angry and to stomp our feet and to yell at our TVs and to blast people on social media. That stuff doesn't help. It's not the way of Jesus. We're called to something far more beautiful a holy way of being as the people of Jesus, a more humble way of living that's slow to anger, that's the mark of a believer. That's steadfast and true and willing to suffer for the sake of Christ with honor and dignity. The early church, a church that suffered far more than we do, talked constantly about one virtue, all the early church writers wrote about it. The notable ones anyway. Church leaders gave powerful sermons on this particular virtue. The one I'll mention in a moment. In fact, one of them referenced this virtue as the supreme virtue in the life of the believers. In other words, he said, this is when the church comes alive. It's a virtue hidden in verse 20 of our text this morning. At the, the beginning here, verse 20, let's read it. 
For what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, it brings favor with God. If you endure it. The hallmark of faithful believers who follow in the footsteps of Jesus and respond to outside courage or outside pressure with courage and conviction and clarity and a willingness to suffer. The hallmark of those people is this. It's patience. It's patience. Endurance. These are a people who believe so strongly in the God of their salvation, in the fact that Jesus is king, that they're able to endure patiently as they wait for God to work out his plan, as they wait for God to save them, as they wait for God to bring justice, and he will. Light in the Valley, I, I cannot predict the future I don't claim to be a prophet, but we can read the scriptures. We can read the scriptures to the people of God. We hear the stories of a persecuted church since the time that it began. We have statistics of an increasingly pagan society around us. And when I say pagan, I don't mean that disparagingly, but they're not saved. They need Jesus. This morning, I urge us back to the gospel, back to a bold and powerful trust in the plan of God, back to becoming a people of patience, willing to suffer as we love the broken world around us, a world that just does not understand Jesus. If we truly believe Jesus is the one who saves us and saves our pagan culture from sin and despair and evil and our pagan friends and neighbors from their despair and sin and evil, then we must have the patience to endure and allow the gospel of Jesus to be revealed in our lives as we suffer, not as we throw punches. We must have God's Spirit so saturating our lives that it's the fruit of the Spirit that comes out when we're marginalized. That there's peace and joy and patience and long-suffering that just oozes out of our being as people punch and take our stuff and enact crazy laws that harm us. So does this mean that we have nothing to say? No. For Peter says, give a defense for the hope that's within you, yet do it with gentleness and patience. So practical example. Right now, one of the biggest threats facing our college, and there are several lawsuits happening right now in the United States trying to settle this issue, it, one of the biggest threats is the fact that we could lose federal funding. The government gives dollars to students to go to college. But if you uh, don't hire your faculty and staff in line with sort of these desires for inclusion and sexual ethics, a certain sexual ethic, the government can pull your funding. If you don't have men staying in men's dorms and women staying in women's dorms, the government can pull your funding. Well, that funding is a huge source of our income. <laughs> so what's a college like us to do? So I've written our state senators, but I wrote with gentleness and respect, trusting that if in fact these the Equality Act becomes law that God will take care of us. I'm trusting in the God of our salvation. I'm not throwing punches at people who simply don't know better and who need Jesus. Anxiety and impatience and mistrust and cowardice causes us to lash out. 
and say and do things that are not of Jesus and they undermine our witness. He bore our sins. He suffered for us. By his wounds, we are healed and we're called priests of the kingdom. We have the privilege, church, in the coming years to have God use our wounds. You, you catch that last part? Peter reminds the church, it's by the wounds of Jesus that you're healed. We have the opportunity to have God use our wounds to heal a pagan culture. To have people see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven when we're persecuted. To have people feel loved even when they hate our guts. Let us be that kind of person full of the fruit of God's spirit. A graceful, bold, patient people. Let that be our testimony. Amen. Brennan, if you want to come forward. As we pray this morning, uh, I don't know if this is you. I'm trusting it's God's spirit leading. And, uh, but um, if there's some of you who've just felt wrapped up in anger at what you see happening, at anger perhaps, at what you've lost, at the seeming injustice of that. And this morning, you've heard the words of Peter to the church. And you want to give your life to God in trust and release that anger. And you want to do that in a fresh way and just start those steps toward Jesus in his kingdom, trusting him with patience. And you'd like some prayer for that uh, as we stand to sing in our closing song. If, if that's you, I just invite you up here and I'd love to pray with you uh, as we close out this morning. God bless you and thanks for inviting me here. May God be honored in your congregation.